Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, and I think it's really appropriate now, given that we've had 12 months of Federal Reserve Bank interest rate hikes. It's kind of culminating here for the Austrian School of Economics, the Austrian theory of the business cycle, the artificial boom, and in the bust. Normally, it's the Fed rate hikes that cause the bust. He's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. He's the author of seven books, including his newest one, The Skyscraper Curse, and how Austrian economics predicted every major economic crisis of the last century, which came out in 2018. It's available for free via PDF, audiobook, and other types of downloads on the Mises Institute website. He's also an economics teacher and the book review editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian School Economics, Dr. Mark Thornton. Thank you for joining me again. Hey, Jason. It's great to be back on the air with you and and no time like the present. And this is the perfect time to talk about Austrian School of Economics because this is just more and more central bank and Fed, Fed blunders. We have the Fed over the last two and a half years just increasing the money supply while the currency supply and saying that inflation was transitory. They helped accelerate and fuel another artificial boom. It made things even worse. And now here with 12 months of Fed rate hikes, it looks like finally we're starting to get a really big bust coming soon. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all playing out. <clears throat> exactly as the Austrian theory of the business cycle would predict. And it's it's got to be a big one. Um, the Fed kept interest rates ultra low, near zero for so many years, um, really completely unprecedented uh, phase uh, of the business cycle. And so, you know, the fact that it's playing out the way the theory expects, um, we should also be on guard for some rather severe consequences, a severe economic crisis. What's funny, Mark, is I interviewed Daniel DiMartino Booth a couple of weeks ago, and she's adamant that the Fed's not going to do bailouts. The Fed's going to let the regional banks fail. The Fed's going to let commercial real estate collapse. I don't think so. I mean, the the way the rules have changed since 2008 and all the crazy stuff, I mean, unless the printing press is taken away from the Fed as as the U.S. dollar loses world reserve currency status, and it's not going to happen overnight. We're recording this interview on Wednesday, April 19th, 2023, for our listeners out there. As long as the U.S. dollar has world reserve currency status, I mean, the Fed has just gotten away with so many hidden and covert bailouts. We know that Dr. Ron Paul was able to get a Fed audit, a partial one-time partial Fed audit back in 2011, and some of the crazy stuff that happened in 2019 and 2020. I mean, I think the average person, Mark, doesn't understand how much currency and credit the Fed created, not just since 2008, but another, what, $6 trillion was added just starting in 2020 with all the extra liquidity programs and the stimmy checks and the extra QE by lowering rates back down to zero. That's right. And, you know, we were looking in 2019, we were looking for uh, a downturn in the economy and in the stock market and, uh, you know, a regular economic bust. And it had started to take place before COVID had ever been announced. Uh, there were troubling signs in the economic statistics, um, things like job openings on the internet had set a record high in December and had started to collapse before COVID was ever announced. And so, you know, that's what we expected to happen is a problem in 2020, 2021. And COVID allowed the Fed to expand the money supply by trillions of dollars. And it allowed the federal government to spend trillions of more dollars. And so this comes on the heel of a Fed expansion of the money supply and near zero interest rates. Uh, so that was, you know, fortunate for Fed officials at the time that they had a, in a great excuse to just go hog wild um, on the money supply. And of course, Congress doesn't need much encouragement to increase spending. And of course, the American public, you know, getting all those checks, they loved it. And uh, they don't like it now, and they're going to hate it going forward. And the Fed and the government, so it wasn't just the Federal Reserve Bank, it was also the government, the politicians, bureaucrats, regulators, they caused all these distors distortions by shutting down small business, supply chain problems. So not only was more currency and credit created, 
So that caused an, an asset bubble boom, an extra asset bubble boom, because it looked like 2019, the repo crisis was going to cause immense problems. And then there was secret bailouts in 2019. And in 2020, you had the pandemic and that gave them an excuse, like you said. But you also had real life supply chain problems on the supply side. So there was all this extra currency and it was chasing fewer goods and services. And that just put even more stagflation. And now with the um, all this currency and credit, even though the government is claiming inflation rates are going down, I mean, in a lot of these other countries, even here in the United States, a lot of um, uh, minimum wage jobs, I mean, they're just the politicians are talking about to get more votes, raising the wages. So this is going to cause even higher costs, even more distortions in supply chain for small business owners. I just don't see politicians allowing, well, central bankers and politicians allowing deflation to last for a long period of time. Well, you know, that's always a problem because the federal government has a lot of debt. And if if we get deflation, it's going to make it hard uh, for them to pay that back, just as it will make it hard for you and me to pay our loans back. Uh, but all of those interventions by the federal government, the, you know, writing checks to everybody not to work, closing down businesses, putting onerous uh, burdens on business and uh, even the public sector, certainly the healthcare sector, um, it was horrendous and, you know, unprecedented. It's not like they took something out of their playbook and used it again. This is something that they just made up on the spot. And in the absence of voter um you know reprisals they 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 simply got away with it and they were essentially grabbing power uh from the economy and from the voters um and running with it and you know they were draining our supply chains essentially there are so many goods and services and it's not across the board because some things were continued in production but a lot of things just shut down and we just simply used up our supply chain uh, during that period of time. So when things opened up, uh, there was all sorts of dislocations in the economy and causing horrendous problems uh, in everyday life. I mean, you couldn't get parts, you couldn't get appliances, you couldn't get automobiles. One of the things that I'm most grateful for in, the, in recent years uh, somebody ran into my car and totaled it, and I went to try to find a replacement, and there was really nothing new or used available. I know that um, you know that even used cars were selling for more than than uh, brand new cars used to, and I just happened to get lucky. Uh, after a long search, I went out of town and found uh, a brand new automobile at the old sticker price. And uh, so I, I felt extremely lucky, like, you know, somebody finding a gold coin or, you know, some magic potion or something. It was, it was really desperate times uh, for everyday consumers and everyday products. And it made life miserable. And again, it made life for politicians and regulators and healthcare officials that made all their lives seem so much very important, uh, so much better. They were, you know, being interviewed and quoted and news uh, on the news and so forth. But the average American suffered tremendously uh, from that. And uh, we continue to do so. And there was also a subprime auto loan bubble that was created because when they lowered interest rates down and there was a shortage of the cars, like you said, this caused people to go out on credit and go and buy cars. And then there was a used car resale market. And now people have, here we are with higher interest rates. A lot of people have variable rate debt along with credit cards. And you have rapidly rising credit card debt here in the United States too, because the average consumer did not have their wage increases to offset the official government inflation rate let alone the real inflation rate, which is, I think, a lot higher than the CPI. I call it the CPI or the Changing Propaganda Index. 
And so with the subprime auto loan bubble, you have people that cannot pay. They have a $1,000 a month car payments and they're not going to be able to pay it. So they're trying to sublease or sell their cars and all this supply is going to hit the market. So that's going to cause a bust too. So this is just added distortions from bad government and Fed policy by lowering the rates and then it created an unexpected credit bubble. Yeah. And that's step one in explaining the Austrian theory of the business cycle is that it all begins with a boom in the economy, and in particular in the stock market, when the central bank, the Federal Reserve, in our case, lowers interest rates artificially low, pumping in artificial credit into the marketplace, you know, that brings down interest rates and it encourages borrowing. And it encourages borrowing to buy houses, to buy cars, uh, to make investments. And of course, the, the biggest um, sign of the boom is that all of those prices become exaggerated and, and go much higher. So housing prices go up, uh, automobile prices go up, uh, investments, real estate, all of that goes up in price. And then when inflation kicks in or the Fed decides to normalize rates or to raise rates to fight inflation, all of a sudden, of course, the higher interest rates, you work it through your financial calculator and that house is worth less, that car is worth less, your stocks are going to go down, your investments um, in business and so forth are all going to go down in value. And, you know, so that's the the most visible and obvious sign of the business cycle as it's being created by the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, there's much more to it, but that's the actual cause and effect mechanism that drives the whole process. Yeah, I agree. And there's trillions of malinvestment of misallocation of capital. I mean, just in the next couple of years, there needs to be $1.5 trillion worth of refining, refinancing of U.S. commercial real estate loans. So that's an absolutely insane amount that doesn't uh, that doesn't count any of the derivatives, over-the-counter derivatives that are tied to falling commercial real estate prices. So we're looking at a monumental bust for U.S. commercial real estate that's not been seen in decades. This might be the worst one in 80, 90, 100 years since the 1920s. I would think so. Of course, our economy is much bigger, but the problem is much bigger too, as you suggest. And, you know, you see it all around the country, the building of commercial uh, real estate, you know, that's always based on current conditions and past conditions. So the, the builders, the real estate people, the owners, they're all, you know, making uh, profitability assumptions based on what commercial real estate is leasable at. What rates can you, uh, you know, get access to uh, commercial real estate or housing? Um, and you know, things do change. Things change in the economy, and things change with the business cycle. So that you know, very often. When the Fed cuts interest rates and and, and ignites this boom and increases incomes and employment and so forth, everybody has more money to spend. And so all businesses, whether they're directly or indirectly or not impacted at all by Fed policy, are going to look better. And so these real estate models that are used to plan investments they're very often based on uh, bad assumptions. So I, I remember so distinctly, um, it was the fall of 2007, and I had been you know, out there pounding uh, the street, uh, telling people that there's a housing bubble and there's going to be problems and so forth. And one of the big comebacks one day, I uh, heard on the radio, well, you know, This looks bad. It looks like we have a housing bubble, but delinquency on loans was at an all-time historic low. But the problem is is that delinquency was at an all-time low at the end of the bubble 
because everybody had money in their pockets at the time. The negative consequences had not surfaced yet. And so, you know, they, you sort of continued along with the euphoria of the boom long after there was really any gas in the tank. Yeah, 2007 for our listeners out there, 2007 for the residential real estate market bubble in the in the US, there were just starting to be cracks. So the cracks had just started 2006 and seven. And so you had all these naysayers that were saying it's not a bubble, it's not going to burst. Home prices ha- across the country have never fallen. Meanwhile, you started to see that the real estate hedge funds for Bear Stearns had failed. And the people had explained that away and said it wasn't that big a deal. You had subprime starting to fail back then. And people were saying, oh, subprime is contained. I remember uh, ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan going on TV and saying it's only subprime. It's not that big a deal. So I mean, the, it just we're hearing very similar things from the commercial real estate people as the residential real estate experts were saying back in 2006 and 2007. Mark, I'm hearing the exact same things from the commercial real estate people now. Yeah, I know. And you know, let me give a plug for my new little mini podcast. It's called Minor Issues. And we try to look at things just like that, the things that don't get mentioned or get brushed aside uh, in the mainstream press or by the public officials. And we try to bring them to light and show why they're important and why they may ultimately impact everybody in the economy. And it's only a five-minute audio podcast and you you'll find it on Twitter or Mises or any podcasting platform uh, and it just is a little one uh, once a week five minute podcast designed to bring out some of these minor issues uh, in the economy that get constantly get overlooked. I just want to give some more examples of the commercial real estate and the real estate bubble that the Fed helped cause. So by lowering rates so low, and I've had conversations with real estate agents here in the DC metro area and also real estate developers, it caused a teardown boom. So because rates were so cheap, you had these real estate developers and they would go and buy expensive land with an old house that was built after World War II or the 50s, 60s, 70s, and the land was valuable. So they'd buy the land at a high price knock down the old home and build a McMansion on it and try to sell it for two, three, two or $3 million here. Uh, that's very common in the DC metro area, especially closer to DC or in DC. And then also you'd have these one floor strip malls, which, you know, they're, they're old. They were built in the fifties or sixties, maybe the seventies. And the real estate developers just said, well, rates are cheap. And rent in this area is starting to go up. We're going to knock these down. We're going to gentrify these old strip malls and old houses. And we're going to turn these into either uh, uh, 10 floor luxury condo areas or mixed use buildings or giant commercial real estate buildings because of cheap rates. So they built a lot of these things on speculation because of cheap rates, hoping that they could uh, lease these, build, uh, lease out a lot of their commercial office space at very high rents. Yeah, and that's a big uh, component of the skyscraper curse analysis, too, that low interest rates drive up the price of land. And so you all of a sudden you start seeing signs being put out on raw land that there's land for sale here. Well, there's always been land for sale there, but now they think they can get a really good price for it. And so you do see this knockdown phenomenon. I see that in Auburn. Uh, today, I've driven past a couple of uh, places on my way home from work where there was one house. Uh, somebody bought the property, tore down the house, and on the larger lots, they put six large houses. Um, and in downtown Auburn, you know, because the land price is high, you have to put more real estate on it. And in the downtown areas, Uh, There's no extra land to build on. And so you have to build up in order to make the investment pay off. You have to create more square footage somehow. So you build higher, more floors. And so the current construction in Auburn downtown is um, our, our version of the skyscraper, which is, you know, like six stories, but Six stories, which was reached during the housing bubble, uh, I think it was five stories during the tech bubble, 
um, essentially, uh, they've reached the limit. The city has imposed a height limit and they've reached that limit. So I would have imagined that if uh, there was no city imposed limitation that we would be looking at seven, eight, nine story buildings in down little old downtown Auburn, Alabama. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about, um, I know we've had this conversation in the past. You were talking about how during the 2008 financial crisis that there was a ton of luxury condos being built right near your football stadium. So people, the real estate developers were trying to sell to um, rich Auburn alumni, these ultra luxury condos where they could go to the football games on the weekends, but like the average person couldn't afford it though. Oh yeah. And you know, that's still, that's still a thing, although it's not a thing in this cycle so much. The new taller buildings are student apartments largely, but they do cater to um so they don't really cater to families at this point but the luxury game day condos from 2006 and five and seven um you know those didn't make it a lot of them didn't make it as game day condominiums they had to be uh, they had to be leased out to students or other people because they just weren't occupied and, uh, you know, so the people who uh, lost money and got foreclosed on those investments, you know, where do you go with that? And uh, you're obviously not going to be able to resell them as luxury game day condominium. So they've had to break uh, contracts and things of that nature in order to get to use the, that property at all. And, you know, we're not really sure uh, this uh, most recent building spree in Auburn is commercial property, uh, lots of parking decks too, um, that sort of thing. And also right now they haven't, um, they haven't start building, but they uh, um, are uh, ready to break ground on two uh, high rise for Auburn uh, micro luxury hotels. Okay. So they're their footprints in downtown Auburn are really too small to build um, the type of hotel you'd see in a larger city, but it's large enough so that they can put these boutique uh, motels in. And like I said, they haven't broken ground on it. I'm not sure if they're going to or if they're ever going to, but that's what the plan is um, before they started raising rates. Yeah, now the cost of capital is so much more expensive, especially for real estate developers. We're starting to actually see, and this was, this was pretty. This would have been a couple of years ago. Very shocking, considering that the DC metro area is considered a very booming economy most of the time and quote unquote recession proof. But just recently, we've had uh, in the last week we had Brookfield, which is a large local commercial real estate developer in the DC metro area. They just defaulted on their bonds of 160 million dollars. And I'm just hearing stories. There's all these newspaper articles of tons of commercial real estate office buildings that are less than 50% occupied in San Francisco, Houston, Chicago, New York City. So it's all the metro areas. You're just seeing story after story after story. The real estate developers, when they were doing their economic calculations, they were relying on high rents. They were relying on high occupancy rates because they were making the cash flow projections that they needed to service their debt, hoping to either um, make a profit with their cash flows for higher rents or to pay off the loans that they used to build the real estate that or normally it's a teardown. So all those numbers now, Mark, just don't make any more sense at the high interest rates. That's right. You know, and, uh, and, and rates, even Fed officials are talking about raising rates even further. And that's with a lot of um, sort of corrections in markets. I mean, people are, you know, the, the inflation, as you said, me as measured by CPI, has come down, and uh, lots of other areas in the economy, like the stock market, have done well. So people are being led to believe that currently things are okay, and that they don't have much to worry about, and if they can just hold on. If Apple price, if this price of Apple stock can just keep going up, 
we'll be okay type of <laughs> a scenario. But, you know, as we said in the beginning, uh, the type and length and severity of Federal Reserve policy was so out of whack with any kind of historical norms that we just have to prepare ourselves financially, psychologically, and otherwise for a very severe economic crisis. Yeah, I agree. I mean, at some point, the Fed's going to have to do a 180 and reverse course, but I wouldn't guarantee that that means asset prices are going to quickly rebound. I, I think the distortions that the Fed has created are just absolutely insane. I mean, they've they've distorted. If you're a small business owner, you're looking at higher taxes. You're looking at much higher input costs. Uh, your labor prices are up. All these costs, it, your supply chain is still a mess in a lot of cases. So they've just created so many problems and distortions with um, bad policy from the Fed and the central banks. But the other thing I wanted to bring up, Mark, is the U.S. government actually, if the Fed wants to keep raising interest rates, the federal government can't afford higher interest rates. So at some point, if they keep raising interest rates, the interest payments on the national debt, they're talking about more defense spending. Um, all the payments for all the transfer payments for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, it just becomes too onerous to where basically the U.S. government, all those payments out for all those things I just mentioned, it's taking up too much of the annual tax receipts. Yeah, I mean, if interest rates are zero and the federal government can borrow at 1%, extra spending seems to be easier to justify and easier to absorb financially by the federal government. <clears throat> but once interest rates start to rise with inflation or with Fed policy, you know, the federal government has to go along with that. They have to pay uh, higher interest rates, and that translates into a, a much bigger interest uh, expenditure at the, you know, by year's end. And, and, you know, that's already going up. Of course, the Fed has a portfolio uh, in its $31 trillion of debt, it has a portfolio that spans from 90 days on, on out to 30 years. Um, so the, the debt is going to be added to and it's going to be rolled over um, as we tripwire over the shorter duration um, and as the longer duration uh, bonds come due, that they have to be paid for. Um, and it makes it it makes it very tricky about adding to that problem, you know the the idea that if they don't cut uh, spending, and of course they all want to increase spending for their own pet projects and for their own glory uh, and for their own reelection, uh, but you know every time they do, they just add to that pile, and now the pile in terms of interest expense is multiplying itself essentially as you go from one to two to three to four percent and you know there's no there's nothing uh that makes me believe in a substantial way that uh interest rates and inflation are going to be uh going down from here uh and i think that people who understand all of the underlying fundamentals which i'm not um, you know, completely familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, but the people who do understand that kind of thing realize that there's still a lot of inflationary pressure uh, left in this marketplace. There's still a lot of cash on the sidelines, so to speak. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there's still plenty of jobs. Um, and so there's nothing to suggest to me that the inflation problem has already been solved. I think Powell knows that. Uh, but Powell also knows that there's a lot of people in Washington who don't like him and want him replaced. Uh, they want um, a more dovish chairman uh, to add to a very dovish board of governors. And, uh, you know, so I don't. Despite their their statements and their answers to questions uh, and their determination to fight inflation, uh, I think at this point it's a, it's an even bet that you know th this is all just a show at this point in time. They see these problems in real estate, for example. They're happy that the stock market hasn't done 
worse than it already has. And I think, you know, once Apple turns over, um, I think a lot of the uh, investors will start throwing in the towel. Apple's been sort of um, supportive of the overall marketplace because it continues to do fairly well, whereas some of the other leaders of the past uh, have taken really big hits. You know, so Tesla and Netflix, you know, they're both doing good today, but they've already they've lost a pretty substantial chunk. And you go right on down the list of these very large valuation companies. Uh, and they've already taken a hit. And I think, um, you know, it's worth noting that a lot of the companies that have taken the biggest hits are precisely in the area that you would expect uh, big hits in the stock market because they're technologically uh, based corporations with leading technology or advanced technology trying to be cutting edge. Uh, like the streaming services, uh, services um, <clears throat> that have already uh, corrected and, and seen their financial story rewritten by the marketplace. A lot of those tech companies, Mark, are not really that innovative. I mean, like the marketing is that, oh, they're innovative or they're doing something. They're really just a lot of these tech companies like Uber and Lyft. They're really just middlemen. I mean, they put up a website between um, someone who has a service, a gig economy, and it's so it's a delivery service or a taxi service. So it's really just a middleman software market app. It's not really innovative tech as Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel wrote a book about this a few years ago from zero to one, talking about how the majority of Silicon Valley is actually not doing incredible innovations. It's actually just doing like really crappy um, incremental improvements there. And then they're doing it very inefficiently. They're not focusing on profits, profit margin, free cash flow. And that's why when you raise the interest rates, Mark, these tech companies are getting, especially the smaller ones that don't have any profits, those ones are getting hurt so much because they can't go to the capital markets and say, because of zero interest rates, uh, we're promising that we're going to grow our technology company, grow revenues, grow earnings faster. Well, a lot of them don't have earnings. So um, now the interest rates are higher. They can't raise the capital as easily. So that's also why you're having a bust. I, I think, Mark, one of the major things about the interest rates that the Fed is not thinking about is that there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies soon if interest rates, even if the Fed doesn't raise them too much more, I think we're going to see a lot of private sector bankruptcies. And historically, the Fed has not reacted well to allowing free market forces and deflation and bankruptcies. Yeah, and you, you see that in the problem with banks, too. Um, you raise the interest rate, all of a sudden upsets their whole financial picture, essentially. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's definitely on the way. There's, there's really no question about it. It's just that Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Signal Bank or whatever it is. Signature. Signature Bank, uh, they were heavily involved with tech and, uh, you know, in real estate. And so it's not surprising that that's where the first cracks in the banking system would be. And with respect to technology, it, it's a valid point that a, a lot of new companies, they use technology, but it's not really a new technology. It's just a new application of existing technology and the software that like Uber, Lyft, that they would use would just be an ordinary software application uh, to, to be directed at a specific problem. When Austrians talk about technology being involved, of course, it's the whole spectrum of technology. But the thing that we're clued into with the skyscraper curse is new technology or advanced technology. And so in skyscrapers, you don't get advanced technology being integrated into the construction and design process until the Fed really floods the market with credit. And that's when new technology becomes profitable. And then as the new technology is integrated into the marketplace, well, it really impacts everything. You know, the trucks that they use, the the everything about the building of buildings has to change subtly 
And that means that the factories that produce the tools and the implements and the raw materials, they very often have to change too. So you do have to be careful. All technology is going to be uh, adversely affected by rising interest rates. But it's this new and advanced technology that once that's adopted into the economy, it's really at least semi-systematic it's in its involvement in the economy. And it, it goes right down, uh, right back to Main Street. You know, people who do air conditioning, people who um, design new tires, people who design nail guns, the factories that produce all of that, all of those things now get readjusted <clears throat> and are not necessarily ideally suited for uh, a normal natural economy. And as a consequence, you know, they're going to be revealed as bad investments, um, investments that came on too soon or maybe shouldn't have come on at all. Now, the skyscraper curse for history was the first one in the U.S. during the 1920s, because I remember reading how the Empire State Building at the time, it was going to be one of the tallest buildings in the world. It was unfinished because um, it was coming online, I think, right around, what, 1929. And so it went unfinished for a number of years. But there's been other examples of this. I remember having you on um, back when your book was coming out, 2018, and we were talking about the Chinese skyscraper curse because they had an enormous commercial real estate boom and residential housing boom with artificially cheap rates and currency and credit just sloshing around in China's economy. And they were building all these luxury condos and skyscrapers, and either they weren't finishing them, the developer was having financial problems, or the luxury condos were built, and then there wasn't enough people to go and buy all of them. Oh yeah, I mean the um, the skyscraper curse. Uh, the person who originally formulated it showed that it go it went back to the Panic of 1907. So the Singer uh, building, the company who made sewing machines uh, in the turn of the century, America around 1900, they were a very profitable company, and they built the world's tallest building and you know it it signaled the panic of 1907 which was severe enough to justify adopting a central bank in the first place there was the woolworth building in 1913 but that was short circuited because of world war 1 and then you get to the great depression the 1920s and you have the chrysler building in new york um the Wall Street building in New York and the Empire State building in New York that were essentially set the record in uh, 1929, early 1930, and early 1931. And as you say, I mean, the uh, Empire State building, the last one of the three to be uh, completed, and it, so we had three uh, new records in a, in a span of about two years. And uh, so the Empire State Building didn't have tenants or they had to cut their rates to steal tenants from other buildings. And, you know, it was a financial flop. The project was a complete uh, flop. As a matter of fact, New Yorkers used to refer to the Empire State Building as the empty state building because it didn't have any tenants. Um, it, it sounds like what they rebuilt with the um, World Trade Center, what they rebuilt, because I think that was empty for a while, too. They had to lower it. That was the same type of construction boondoggle, what, four or five years ago. They had to lower the lease rates, too, in that building, and it was filled with mostly government workers. Yeah, and as the World Trade Towers were themselves. I mean, that was almost an entire uh, government operation center uh, in the World Trade Towers. There was very little... Uh, in a relative sense, private sector activity, universities were in there, you know, all sorts of things, but not the productive engine part of the uh, American economy. It was more like the Port Authority. I think the CIA had an office there. Uh, and there were financial firms uh, in there as well, but almost nothing in terms of production uh, in the economy. Uh, 
was in the World Trade Towers. And, you know, that's that's a problem. But if you're if you're first in, if you're one of the first ones in, uh, you can get the tenants. Uh, but and, you know, China's been building these massive skyscrapers all along. And they justify that by saying, well, the population is going to move from rural areas into urban areas and the economy is going to expand and we're going to do all this. Uh, but they're still having trouble filling all of those buildings. I, I think that some of them, the older ones in Shanghai, um, are doing okay, but there's so many of them. Uh, I don't even follow it anymore. Uh, I can't keep track of them and, and I can't uh, pronounce the names of them, uh, but they're building massive super skyscrapers. Oh, there was a competition doing it. There was a competition. It was similar to the skyscraper curse that you wrote about here in the United States, where you said there was record setting skyscrapers here in the United States, uh, three of them in what, two and a half, two, two and a half years. I mean, that competition in China in the major, in the tier one, tier two, tier three cities, there was new competitions every like six to 12 months of taller and taller buildings. Yeah, that China is another story. Well, as we wrap up here, Mark, I want to get your thoughts on deflation. So do you think then the people in power in D.C., in the government, the federal government at the Federal Reserve Bank, are they going to allow free market forces, bankruptcies, deflation for a long period of time? Or historically, do you think they won't allow this? They're going to have to they're going to probably reverse course, do bailouts, pick and choose winners and losers. And then the Fed's what going to drastically expand their balance sheet because the narrative now is the Fed's going to allow bankruptcies, the Fed's reducing its balance sheet, the Fed's going to keep interest rates high. But from a financial history perspective, I mean, the Fed does not remain disciplined, does not tend to allow bankruptcies, especially post 2008. Yeah, they're a political animal and they have political pressure on them. So, yes, I mean, we're going to have deflation of asset oriented prices for sure. We already are, and I think that's going to continue, and it's going to be quite substantial, actually. Um, I don't expect a lot of that to filter into the CPI. Um, you know, it obviously will because housing is a component of CPI and, and, and automobiles are. So there are interest-sensitive goods in the consumer price index, but you know, there's it's there's way too much, you know, like the Fed and the Treasury, uh, they, you know, when uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, went under, I mean, they basically announced that, well, they'll cover all deposits of all banks. And so they've already taken on an enormous burden and they've made an enormous promise to the American people. And I don't see how they're going to be able to keep it. Um, I have a feeling we're we're facing the a little bit of the unknown in the sense that, you know, when the Fed got into these problems with the housing bubble, financial crisis, uh, they just invented new things, and uh, they've. Are you talk? Are you talking about the emergency liquidity programs that had weird names like the alphabet soup of liquidity programs? Because rather than, I think the public understands what quantitative easing means. That is like bailouts and money printing or Fed expanding its balance sheet. So you're saying that they're going to be changing definitions and coming up with new hidden like covert bailout facility programs to obfuscate and con confuse things for the regular person. I, I think they're going to have to, um, and they're they're going to have to find a way to keep this off of the books. Uh, so to speak, uh, the problems are enormous. They obviously, you know, they, they, they realize that not every bank is going to go bankrupt, but um, they've made that promise. And I, I really don't know um, how they expect to keep that um, going forward. Uh, but they've already, you know, like I said, they've already changed the rules of law. They've changed the rules of, uh, of finance as it applies to the central bank. They've changed the, the underlying features. So, for example, in the last few weeks, the Fed's um, asset accounting has turned negative. They're, you know, in a sense, bankrupt themselves. Um, you know, so they, they've, they've done away with the 
accounting constraints on themselves and it's starting to show already. I mean, they're, if, if, you know, because they have, they have lots of assets too, right? They have tons of government debt. They have tons of real estate loans uh, that they bought up when interest rates were um, pretty low and real estate values were pretty high. Well, they don't, they, have, they don't have to mark those losses down because they don't have to adhere to generally accepted accounting pr- principles. But you're right, though. So if they were a private sector company and not a large bank like JP Morgan, because JP Morgan has an exemption from mark to market accounting too, as of March 2009, the large banks in the US do. So if the Fed actually had to mark down those bond losses, because what the average listener doesn't understand when interest rates go up, the bond prices go down. So actually, like uh, these insurance companies, regional banks, large U.S. banks, the Federal Reserve Bank, all these people holding lots of treasuries for years now, as the interest rates went up, actually their bond losses should be enormous. The Fed also, with the higher interest rates, Mark, the Fed has to pay out tons and tons of interest payments to the large banks and all the other financial entities that have cash parked at reverse repo. There's over $2 trillion at reverse repo. The Fed's paying high interest rates on that out. So the Fed's deeply cash flow negative, and they're paying high interest rates on interest on excess reserves, which are all those QE programs that like the narrative for years was, oh, the banks have all these reserves at the Fed, and the Fed's paying them a higher rate to keep the cash parked there. And Ben Bernanke and and uh, Janet Yellen were like, that's not inflationary because the reserves from QE are still at the docked at the Fed, and we're paying them rates to corral it. So it's uh, sterile. I think they said it was sterilized or something. But now with the higher interest rates, Mark, I mean, the Fed is just paying out like tens of billions of dollars in interest payments to all that cash parked there. And their portfolio is falling apart. Um, you know, and I think that the ramifications, we could go on and on about this and, and speculate with good cause about the problems that we're going to face. And, I, you know, but ultimately they're going to be very widespread. They're going to be very severe. Uh, pensions, you mentioned life insurance uh, and insurance companies. Um, they're, they've got to be uh, getting themselves into financial trouble. And, you know, pensions, um, you know, that ultimately this is going to result in lower levels of economic activity, lower levels of uh, government, uh, real government revenues and, uh, you know, their ability to provide services and to pay pensions is going to come into question uh, over the next several years. Uh, because they were already on pretty thin ice. I mean, the Fed's uh, zero interest rate policy hurt insurance company. It hurt um, uh, pensions. It hurt people's retirements. It forced everybody into taking more risk. And that risk is going to come home to roost um, as we move forward into the economic crisis itself. So the risks that you mentioned for our listeners out there, so these pension funds, these insurance companies, a lot of them did leverage trades. So to try to boost returns because they weren't able to get in the past for 15 years, 5% interest rates on US treasuries, they had to try to gamble and take riskier bets. So they they gambled on stocks, they gambled on commercial real estate, they hired portfolio managers for hedge funds, private equity, they gave those guys venture capital, they gave those guys lots of extra capital. And with higher interest rates, all those trades that they put on with leverage, assuming lower interest rates, so they could boost returns, now they're going to start to see big, big losses. I, I'm afraid I agree, um, you know, and it, it, it impacts everybody, uh, whether you know it or not, whether you've done anything or not to change your financial planning, um, it, everything around you has been forced uh, to meet those, uh, meet with federal reserve policy and the, those ultra low interest rates. Um, you know, and now, of course, it, it even has is stopping people from moving to better paying jobs because they they can't make economic sense of selling the house and mortgage that they have now and moving and buying uh, a house and new mortgage at someplace else. So it's a real pickle that we've gotten ourselves into, Jason. And uh, I hope everybody out there is now aware of that. And taking some steps to try to soften the blow. 
yeah, the, all, all this bad policy from governments and central banks, especially the Fed, has caused just tremendous distortions throughout the economy and asset markets and the real economy with jobs and capital allocation. And this is why I think when foreign governments, Mark, look at the federal government, U.S. government finances with the higher interest rates, even though they could earn supposedly over 4% risk-free buying short-term U.S. treasuries, this is why you're not seeing China, Germany, and Japan go and buy a lot of U.S. treasuries. They're selling U.S. treasuries, most of them anyway. Uh, Most of those uh, two countries uh, China and Japan are selling U.S. treasuries, and the uh, non-G7 central banks are buying a lot of physical gold tonnage. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and <clears throat> our listeners sh- should probably be thinking about doing things along those lines as well, reducing leverage and uh, raising cash or money. Yeah, I I probably wouldn't save in fiat currencies over the long term at this point. It seems like all these governments, whether it's Japan, the European Union, uh, the US, China, they all seem to be want to print. They have housing bubble problems or problems with their corporations or banks, and it seems they're going to want to do bailouts in the not too distant future. Well, Mark, I really enjoyed our discussion today. If my listeners want to check out your new podcast, take a look at some of your books, how did they do so? Well, go to Mises.org. We've got tremendous resources for people who want to understand the economy. Um, I'm on Twitter at Dr. Mark Thornton, D-R-M-A-R-K-T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. And I'm on Mises.org all the time. We have several podcasts and books and articles and everything under the sun for anybody out there who wants to become more economically literate in something outside the mainstream media and government and and their pronoun, uh, you know pronouncements. Um, take a look around, get a different point of view, and I think you'll be better off as a result. And your newest book, the Skyscraper Curse. You have the ebook and the audio book available for free. But if our listeners want a hard copy, they can order it from the Mises Store. That's correct, and uh, or Amazon or any other place. Um, it's out there. It's uh, inexpensive and it's well worth it. It's actually two books, one of which uh, explains the skyscraper curse and the history of the skyscraper curse. And the other half looks at economic crises in the 20th century and what Austrians and mainstream economists said beforehand about the economy. And in all the cases, in all the chapters, I show that the Austrians showed tremendous concern for about a looming economic crisis. And the mainstream media uh, and mainstream economists were lauding the glories of government intervention and how well the stock market was booming. So that's the main point of this podcast. And if you want the historical background, I encourage you to at least get the PDF of the book. Yeah, at this point, with all the stuff that Janet Yellen has said publicly for years, I mean, basically anything she says, the opposite's going to happen is going to be true. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, well said. didn't she say when your book, your skyscraper book came out, and this was before the 2019 repo crisis, I think around 2018, she said there would be no more financial crises in our lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's, if you listen to the media, they'll say, oh, well, she made great predictions about the housing bubble. But if you actually go back and look at what she wrote and look at what she said, there's nothing there at all to speak of. Oh, yeah. She, for our listeners out there, she was at the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank for many years, and she totally missed the housing bubble leading up in 2007, 2008. For years, she was writing how there was no housing bubble. Right. Right. 